Welcome to the Green Portal, a forum for issues related to people, politics, and economy as it affects our planet. Today, we will explore the backlash to neoliberalism and how that is changing our world. We know it's changing. Every sector feels it, from the poorest to the richest. We are in the midst of a profound revolution. The reason for the change is not Donald Trump. He is a symptom, not the cause. It is a mistake to play into Trump's autocratic ego. The real cause goes back much further. The real cause is economics, the globalization of neoliberalism. Since 1998, incomes in the developing world, China, India, Africa, are rising, while at the same time, the incomes of middle class people in the developed economies are either stagnant or falling, while the middle class is experiencing stagnant or no growth in their incomes. The people benefiting most from this globalization are the top 10%, elite workers and the families of the most wealthy and privileged among us. These economic changes and their effect on the middle class in developed economies is exponential and will be even greater as the population continues to grow. Get your mind around this. Each yellow dot represents one million people. When our nation was founded, the world's population was under one billion people. We did not reach two billion until around 1933. By 2020, we will be at eight billion people, and most will be living in developing countries where climate change, global warming, will affect the most people. With climate change come droughts, wildfires, severe weather, flooding, and food shortages. This will increase migration and put greater pressure on developed economies and their middle class. How are we going to deal with this? Here's how Professor Jack Goldstone, in a recent lecture at Brown University, sees it. Talking, carping, acting like we're somehow smarter or have the real answers will not work. You're looking at a popular movement based on emotion led by elites who want to break and transform the system. Um, that's difficult. So what can one do? First thing is to embrace the revolution's supporters. Uh, it really bothers me when I see people criticizing Trump supporters or supporters of Brexit as people, oh, they don't understand their own interests, uh, they're not educated, they're easily taken in. That's not fair. It's, it really is necessary to embrace the people who want change and recognize the validity of their concerns. Yes, there are bigots, there are unpleasant people who are on the Trump bandwagon, that's true. But that's not a majority. That's not the people who took someone who you would think is completely implausible as a candidate and not only made it close, but actually got, got them elected. And as I've said before, I mean, yes, the election was close, but I take no comfort in that because it shouldn't even have been close unless people really wanted a radical change. And frankly, uh, Clinton did not easily uh, do away with the threat from Sanders, if not for the superdelegates, which was kind of an elite system to prevent an insurgency within the Democratic Party, Clinton might not have won the nomination. And indeed, the fact that a lot of Sanders supporters were so turned off by that and sat on their hands was important for Trump's victory. So everywhere you look, there is deep opposition to the status quo, to politics as usual. Um, so embrace the supporters of that. And it's necessary to show there are real solutions that give people hope, dignity, and value their needs. People want health care. Maybe the Republican plan will offer that, maybe it won't. 
But whoever comes up with a real solution that makes people feel confident for the future is going to get political support. So show that Trump's solutions or his extreme solutions won't help people, but actually might make them poorer or less safe, and you may start to chip away at his support. But just criticizing Trump or criticizing his supporters won't do the trick. And it's necessary to be realistic. Obamacare is in trouble. It was never properly completed. There are demographic forces with an aging population and rising costs of health care that need to be dealt with. Social Security and Medicare are okay, but they are facing trouble down the road too, and a lot of state and local pension systems particularly. You can't just pretend that everything will be okay. We need to find practical solutions and solutions that will work for everyone and not just for the poor, not just for the rich, but really try and treat America as very diverse, but everyone needs to benefit. I think the core needs are education, health, jobs, and respect. It's easy to give respect to people, but we often don't do it. It's harder to provide jobs for people, but the best way to provide jobs is to have a growing economy, and the best way to keep the economy growing is to keep it open because other parts of the world are poised to grow faster than the United States. So those two parts are relatively easy. Healthcare is complicated. When Trump said, who knew that healthcare was so complicated? The answer is, well, we all did, which is why it was very tricky to work on. But we need to figure out ways to improve the delivery and access to healthcare. And education, we're here in one of the great universities of the world. America has the greatest universities in the world. But it may not have them forever if we can't continue to attract the best people from all over the world. And if we can't provide the type of primary and secondary education to maximize the talent that we have here. I don't think vouchers are the answer, but it is very clear that we have an educational system that compared to other educational systems in the world has much greater variation than it should. The best students in America are still the best in the world. But the range of variation in achievement in America is also greater than most other countries. And that handicaps us going forward. If people felt that their needs in these areas were being addressed, I think they'd be much more comfortable. Now, the, the worry is if moderate measures fail, revolutions usually go in more, moder in more radical directions. So if, if the only thing that opponents to Trump do is block programs so that nothing gets done for another four years, we might end up with a more radical alternative on the horizon. Things are, things are never going to go back to the way they were. We're not going to have another baby boom. The U.S. is never going to be much richer than all the other countries in the world. We've got to kind of come to terms with living in a more balanced world, but also give American, Americans confidence that they will have a leading role in that world. I think Obama tried to do that quietly, but there were too many failures in practice. That elephant curve with half the population falling backwards relative to the rest of the world, that undermined all the, the good plans. I think it's important to focus on processes and laws. It's, every, it's not worth fighting every battle, right? What's really important is to focus on preserving the Constitution at all costs. That's what has made America exceptional. It's kept our government flexible and resilient. And the idea that we can somehow solve our problems by not paying too much attention to constitutional niceties, just let the strong man get on with it, that's what undermined democracy in much of Latin America and Asia in the last 50 years. So there we have it. We the people must preserve our Constitution at all cost. So what are the issues we need to put in front of our elected representatives? First, the state is not a business. It is not here for our representatives to profit from. Second, corporations are not people. We need to get big money out of politics. And third, the preamble of the Constitution has it right, and it should be something that every citizen of the United States memorizes. <laughs>